single person is here. And I'm glad that God has a specific job for each person here. We'll just follow him. He'll lead us, he'll guide us, and he'll help us. There's a plan for you, God's kingdom. I'm glad that I can stand here and know that for sure. God has a plan for you. And I was just thinking about that chorus earlier. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. I was thinking about that chorus. I was thinking, I hope that as every one of our prayers here today, that chorus, pray that chorus over our mind, pure and holy, tried and true. If we can just get that focus in our mind, that we're going to serve God, follow me, we'll use each and every one of us for his kingdom. At this time, six and a half cousins are going to come and minister to us. And directly after that, Brother Andrew Stroud is going to come and present what the Lord has given him. And that's every one of them, with full attention, just concentrate on the Lord and focus on him. He wants to help us.
with the people on the flyer. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Anybody remember that I was the baldest person on that flyer? <laughs> All right, that was in his little game, you know, that he played with him. Well, we brought Eric Coons up here last year, and we brought it before the whole convention. And believe it or not, I indeed was the most bald person on that flyer by your votes. And I, it's been really traumatic this year. I've used all kinds of products on my head trying to, <laughs> trying to make it uh, grow and so forth. But you know now why Solomon Schaefer is here, because we're going to do it again. <laughs> because Solomon and I, we actually, I know that Fred Bennett's getting close. His hair is receding. Yeah, but he's old. He's old? Okay. Well, we're going to do this again because, unfortunately, Solomon and I both have, we're probably two of the baldest people. And that's really exciting to me. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let you vote again, all right? And what I'm going to do is I am going to let the person that you cheer the loudest for be the one that is the baldest, okay? Because we need that affirmation. We're going to be bald. Just one more affirmation. You're trying to sway votes. We're not going to do that. Okay, I also want you to really vote for the person, not just because you like him and you want me to be the most bald or you hate him and want me to be the one that's the most hair. Okay, vote really. Realistically, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to bend over, show our front side. All right, and then hold on, we're not going to And then we're going to turn around, and I'm going to show you the back side of our head. Okay? Are you ready? Are you ready to vote? Okay, everybody clear on the instructions? You're going to cheer for the loudest, okay? Here we go. <laughs> All right, if you think Solomon is the most bald, let me hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. It's, it's been good to be here. If you think I'm the most bald, let me hear you. Hang on, real quick. See, Matt Malloy started this, and I think it needs to stop with Matt Malloy. This is getting boring doing this every year. And so I had an idea. I think what we ought to do, how would you like? We had 839 people in the service last night. That was awesome, right? But next year, if you, what if we can get 1,000 people in the Friday night service, and then in this session, we shave Matt Malloy's head bald? Do you like that? saying we should do that. I'm just saying that's how we think and pray about. All right, I'm that Barry Mason better be on the schedule for next year. Because <laughs> I, well, I, I just don't want to be the most bald person. <laughs> oh, well, anyway. Well, I'm, it is a privilege for me to be here. I'm actually blaming my youth group from Burlington because they tell me that in the afternoon session when they fill out the evaluation sheet as possible speakers, it's my youth group that has suggested me for a couple of years. And so I'm blaming this session all on them, and you can join me in blaming them. Well, didn't Nathan Purdy do a great job today? Yeah. Thank you, Brother Nathan Purdy, and uh, wonderful, wonderful truth. And don't you just love his accent? And, uh, you know, I don't have that accent. Uh, but will you listen to me anyway today? I hope you will. I actually thought that since we're from Kentucky, maybe I could just speak in some sort of hillbilly accent. But I figured the only ones who would understand me is my youth group and, and Adam Buckler. Since he's from Kentucky. <laughs> But um, anyway, you know, we're, we are from Kentucky, and you probably think as soon as you cross the river out of Cincinnati, cross the Ohio River into Kentucky, you think everybody is redneck. But really, our church isn't redneck, is it? It really isn't. You know, in all my visitation in Patton Homes, I have never once went to one of our uh, houses of people in our church who used a toilet lid for a picture frame. Never once. <laughs> yeah. now, I've, been to, I've been to several weddings. Not one of the wives had to pull out the toothpick out of their mouth for the picture. That's <laughs> never happened. And so we really, we really are not rednecks. We're fairly cultured people, and you ought to come visit us sometime. On a serious note, in preparation for the truth, once the convention committee asked me to share, there were, there were three things that I wanted to accomplish in this session, and, and I hope to accomplish in this session this afternoon. And first of all, I wanted to be memorable. I wanted you to be able to remember what I shared. Now, I know that that's kind of a tall order, and, uh, and unless you're an order like Jim Plank or a really long-winded <coughs> preacher like uh, a Stedler, um, really, most services and sermons are hard to remember, but I do want to, to make this session memorable. I want it to be brief, and everyone said? Amen. 
Uh, it was George Burns who said, start with something interesting, end with something interesting, and keep them as close together as possible. So we're going to try to do that. But thirdly, and most importantly, I wanted this session to be transformational. I want you young people, I want you to, I want you, your life to be different because you've been in this session today. I don't want this session to just be a waste of your time. Uh, I want you to be impacted and changed because you've been here today. And I will just quickly tell you that we have adjusted the schedule so summer's not quite at four. So uh, you can relax a little bit, not too much. But uh, anyway, we are going to try to share what the Lord has, has given to me. The title that was given to me for this session is actually the title and the convention theme, that of Standing Firm. But before I, before I address this subject, with your permission, I, I want to address a, a connecting thing momentarily. I want to begin by, by stating the obvious. Don't you love people who state the obvious? I mean, it seems like I, I, I'm around people who are the epitome of Captain Obvious. You, you know the type of person I'm talking about. There's one in every crowd. I mean, they walk out of sub-zero temperatures into the warm building. And they, they act like they're a reporting meteorologist giving some breaking news and they think, oh man, it's cold outside. And everybody turns and says, thank you, Captain Obvious. I want to be Captain Obvious for just a couple of moments at the beginning of this session. Brother Buckler touched on this last night, but you young people are living in a culture where the moral foundations are crumbling at an alarming rate. <coughs> Let me share two or three examples. Although there are, there are many indicators on a national level, and Brother Buckler mentioned this last night, last year's Supreme Court decision on the constitutional right for homosexual marriage is, is a huge national indicator of a crumbling moral foundation. This country has scoffed at and abandoned the precepts and principles of God's Word, and you young people are living and seeing the results of it. But not only in our world are we seeing the, the moral foundations crumbling, but, but in the church world we are seeing it as well. Some time ago I was, I was reading the magazine Christianity Today and I, and I saw this, this headline that caught my attention and it said, Atheist pastor allowed to keep post. This, this pastor in the Netherlands, this Dutch pastor in the Netherlands has, has written a book titled Believing in a God that Does Not Exist. And in that book, he, he basically claims that he believes in the idea of a God, he believes in the theory of a God, but he, he denies the actual existence of a God. How far can we go? Same magazine, it was, it was reported that a lady by the name of Margaret Kessman, who, who re she resigned as the head of the 25 million member evangelical church in Germany. She was the head person of that member, 25 million member church. And she was tested positive for drunk driving. What's interesting is, I read a bit, little bit later, and the same lady... The same lady that was tested positive for drunk driving was remaining bishop of the, of the church where she's been serving since 1990. Isn't that staggering? The Nazarene church today is, is debating the inerrancy of scripture. And even, I would tell you young people, even within our own conservative holiness ranks, there seems to be a shaking on the foundations which if it is not stabilized, it will cause a crumbling on the very foundation that we have appreciated and we have enjoyed through years. But it's not just the world. It's not just the church world. But you young people here this afternoon, in a personal way, you are connected and know people that you either went to Bible college with, someone in your family, some of your friends who once had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they have walked away from deciding to abandon Christ. But you know, as I, as I consider these crumbling foundations within the culture, the church world, and in our sphere and circle of friends, I'm quickly reminded that, that you're not living in unique times in the 21st century. You young people, you're not living in a culture that has never faced these types of crumblings before. Scripturally, if you were to open your Bibles to the last 
the last chapter in the book of Judges, you would read the words there that every man did what was right in their own eyes. Friends, young people, I want to tell you, that is a recipe for a crumbling moral foundation when everyone does what is right in their own eyes. What is right for me is not right for you. What is wrong for you is not wrong for me. Everybody's just doing whatever's right in their own eyes. That is the recipe for a crumbling. But during the same time, the world was crumbling, the religious world was crumbling. Just a couple of books later, the first chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, we find a priest by the name of Eli who had lost spiritual perception. He even tolerated and involved his own sinful sons in the duties associated with the religious rituals. And in doing so, he, he assisted in the spiritual decline of the religious climate of his day. But also on a personal level, we... We find scripture giving us many examples of those who one time had a relationship with God. Then fell spiritually. My mind goes to the writings of the apostle where he talks about those who made spiritual shipwreck. Talks about Demas who forsook Paul having loved this present world. What was it? The individuals came to a point in their life instead of standing, they crumbled. So we, we see the, clearly the unfortunate reality of a crumbling foundation, both historically in the scriptural accounts and presently in our own current culture. But in the midst of a crumbling foundation, both historically and presently, I want you young people to know that God has always had a people. That God has always had a remnant that has chosen to stand when the foundations all around him were crumbling. I read my Bible, you read your Bibles, and we read the accounts. We think, of, we think of Daniel, we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We think of Esther, we think of Samuel, we think of Elisha, we think of Elijah. The 700 who had not bowed down, bowed their knee to Baal. All of these stood when everything around them was crumbling. And young people, I love, I love those accounts. And I love reading those accounts and, and kind of learning the lessons that go along with them. But what is interesting to me is that God did not choose those people to live in 2016. God didn't choose David. God didn't choose the three Hebrews. God, did, God didn't choose Esther or all of any of these. But, but what happened is Jesus in the ever-present, the Lord in the ever-present, looked down all the way through, all, of, all the way through, and he looked to 2016, and he saw you, and he saw you, and he saw you, and you, and you, and me. And was expecting us to stand and not crumble in 2016. You say, Andrew, I want to stand. I don't want to crumble. I, I don't want to cave when, when all around everything is giving way. But how can I stand? How can I stand when how can I stand firm in a culture that, that caves to every biblical principle and precept? How can I stand firm in a church world that is that is seemingly compromising on everything that comes down the pike? How can I stand firm when so many of my friends and my family are choosing to walk away from the relationship with God? Let me attempt to address this in the remaining moments we have. To do this, to do this, I've taken my liberty and simply added a subtitle to the session they've given to me. I want to talk about stand firm. Foundation. <coughs> foundation is everything. You know, if you don't believe foundation is important, you ought to ask Banano or Sami. <laughs> Anybody know Banano or Sami? Well, you probably, you probably are not going to be able to ask him because he's been dead for probably over 800 years. But Bonanno Pisano was, was an Italian architect whose major pro project, anybody know? Leaning, all right, we're having some trouble here. Leaning Tower. That tower has been standing over for over 800 years. Presently, that tower is 18 feet off of center position. Have you seen pictures of it? You Google pictures of it, and there are all these all these pictures come up of these perspectives where people are taking pictures, and it's back there, and they're here, and they're trying to hold it up. That tower is leaning. You know why it's leaning? Banano Pisano didn't accurately assess the soil composition when he began designing <coughs> the foundation, and the foundation could not stand what he was building on it. You know what? Today, the architects are telling us that the Tower of Pisa is going to fall. It's going to fall someday. 
because of the foundation. Listen to me, young people. If you're going to stand when so many things and so many people are crumbling, you're going to have to pay close attention to the foundation on which you're building your life. Let me talk about the proper foundation that will ensure a firm stand. And I know at this, at this time, when the preacher gives a book of the Bible and a chapter, everybody kind of settles down and starts to go to sleep. But I want you to give me your ear for just a little bit. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Jesus shares what we would consider probably his most famous sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And many people had gathered to hear Jesus on this day. And Jesus began talking to them about a, a plethora of subjects, multiple subjects he's been teaching the people on. And basically, Jesus says, in conclusion, he doesn't use those words in conclusion, but basically, he says the same thing that would indicate that, that would indicate he's closing. He says, whosoever hears all of these things, he lumps all of the sayings that he's been teaching about, whosoever hears all of these sayings of mine and does them, and I think at this point, everybody in the congregation is kind of waking up a little bit and sitting up and rubbing their eyes and saying, oh, he's about to conclude. And, and as they begin to tune into what Jesus is saying, he says, whosoever hears what I teach and does them is like the wise man who builds his house on a rock. And the rain and the flood and the winds being against that house stands. In a contrasting statement, Jesus basically says the opposite. Those who hear and disobey are like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The same elements came against him. The house fell and great was the fall. Jesus, Jesus kind of pulls all of the teachings together and he brings it down to a close using this simple illustration. Let me, let me quickly notice the comparisons with you. The individuals, the wise man and the foolish man, were both building a house. The house they were building represented the life they were living with every single choice that they made. They were picking up the hammer and putting another nail in the house. They were putting another brick. They were putting another piece of plywood up. Another shingle. With every single choice they made. Let me just pause momentarily long enough to tell you young people that you are presently building a house with every single choice. Right. Every single choice. Your choice of good or bad friends. Your choice of going to church or staying home. Your choice of honoring or dishonoring your parents. Choice of respecting or disregarding the authority figures in your life. And you know what I'm convinced? I'm convinced that, that some young people feel like they are, they are building two houses. It's almost like that over here they're building this house with their good choices. They're saying, oh, I'm going to go to church today. That's a good choice. Oh, I'm going to honor my parents today. That's a good choice. I'm going to do this kind deed for this person who maybe doesn't deserve it. Oh, that's a good deed. I'm building a good house. And then over here they're building another. In their mind, over here they're building another house with their friends or they're by themselves and they're making bad decisions and they think, Oh, when this house crumbles, when my bad decision house crumbles, I'm going to run over here to my good house. I want to tell you something, young people. You're not building two houses. You're building one house by the choices that you make. Every single choice. You say, I don't want to make a house. I don't want to build a house. Listen, the only way to stop building your house, the house of your life right now, is to die. Every choice you're making is building the house. The second comparison in Jesus' closing illustration is they both heard the teachings of Jesus. I mean, if we were to modernize the story, the children, as children, these, these two, the wise man and the foolish man, as children, they would have went to Sunday school. They would have went to vacation Bible school. They would have went to junior church. They graduated out of junior church into the youth department. They went to Sunday school. They go to teen worship. They go to youth camp. They go to youth convention. They graduate. They move on up to adult church. They go to Sunday school. They go to church. They go to camp meeting. They are exposed to the teachings of Jesus, just as many of you are here today. Most of you. All of you here. I would submit that all of you are here because you have a pastor or a youth leader who has brought you here, and they've been faithful to teach God's Word to you. <coughs> These two individuals were familiar with Jesus' teachings. But the third comparison is they, 
that both houses that they were building experienced the rain and the flood of the These elements represented the difficult challenges that the two individuals faced throughout their lives. Perhaps it was for them as it is for you in your spiritual walk. Maybe, maybe the difficult circumstances was maybe a temptation or, or maybe it was ridicule on the job or maybe it was isolation and living the Christian experience by your own. Whatever it was, whatever it is, you're well acquainted with the difficult circumstances that life brings. So, the comparison, they were both building their house with every choice they made. They both faced the same difficult circumstances of life. They both heard the teachings of Jesus, but the end result of each of the houses was very different. The wise man's house, over here it stood. The foolish man's house fell. What was the difference? The defining difference was the foundation on which they were built. The foundational issue that determined whether their, their house would stand or fall was determined by their response to Jesus' teaching. Listen to me, young people. The bottom line of the whole thing, the issue of your standing, the issue of your crumbling, really boils down to your commitment or your lack of commitment to obedience. You say, oh, preacher, not going to serve no obedience. That's all we hear about, obedience, obedience, obedience. Because it's so important and so many people struggle with obedience. All throughout your life, you're going to come to the crossroads. Many times a day, every day of your life, you're going to come to the crossroads. Where the choice you make is going to cause you to stand. Now, perhaps I can call those critical moments, that crossroads, perhaps I can call it Dante's view. You see, in the state of Nevada, there's a national park named Death Valley. And in that national park, there, there is a place known as Dante's view. And from, from that lookout, you can, look to, you can look down to the lowest spot in the United States, a depression in the, in the earth 200 feet below sea level. They call it bad water. So on this side, you, you see bad water, this 200 foot below sea level depression. But from the same vantage point, you can also see the tallest peak, Mount Whitney, 14,500 feet. <coughs> One way leads to the lowest, the other way to the highest. And from that point, any movement must be in one or the other direction. And there are many times in life when we stand where the ways part. We stand at the crossroads. We stand where choices must be made. And young people, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's at these crucial moments where we make the choice to either stand or come. Now, what I'm going to do for the remainder of this message, I'm going to do something that's a little bit different. Perhaps it will help in making it memorable. Maybe not so much in making it brief, but making it memorable. I'm going to quickly consider just three of the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount that are so relevant, I believe, to young people today and try to illustrate in a tangible way what happens when we obey or disobey. I need two builders here this, this afternoon, and I was going to use my brother-in-law, Kenny, but he's holding my son, which is asleep. So I am going to use Tim Cole. Is that him back there? He slipped in. Tim, why don't you come up here? And uh, let's see here. Jonathan Blake, why don't you come up here? Give these guys a hand. They thought standing in the back they wouldn't be noticed and they could slip out and not hear the truth this afternoon apply to them. Come on up here. One of these is a wise man, one was a foolish, and they can find it out. I don't care who's who. But the wise man is going to stand over here, and the foolish man. Okay, now, <clears throat> how you doing, wise man? Not one of the three wise men, but another wise man. Okay, nobody got that. Uh, let's see here. Now I need the other guys that I've asked to help me to come up here rather quickly, real quickly. It should be 12 of them. <clears throat> All right, give these guys a hand. Sacrificial leaving their girlfriends and coming to help me out. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Okay. 
These two guys here, this foolish man Jonathan and this wise man Tim, are going to build a house. Okay? Now, they don't have to say anything. Um, I'm going to do all the talking, uh, which you guys are so excited about. But that's the way it's going to happen. And well, these two guys right here are going to build a house right here on this today, right here on this platform. Okay? And the wise men are over here, so I think you guys can over here. So you guys are foolish. Alright, where's Stephen E. Banks? Oh. He was supposed to be here. Stephen, Stephen come on over here. Here we go. He's a foolish man. Okay, so we have this wise man and foolish man building a house, and I want them to go ahead and build the house, alright? You come over here by me, come over here by me. The guys behind you know what they're going to do. Go ahead and build your house, guys. Alright? Go ahead and build your house. Just pyramid. Alright? These guys are building their house with every choice they make. All right, they chose to give their life to Jesus. That's a good one, right? They, they chose to spend time with God. Now, listen, let me just, let me offer this caveat. If this side over here falls, it's not part of the analogy. Okay? <laughs> this is the point. Okay, now I've got three because they don't have time. They don't have more time. So they made good choices. Chose to spend time with God in their devotions. They chose to make restitutions. They chose to attend church regularly. Chose to honor their parents, chose to let their light shine, but they came to the crossroads of a decision. Both of these guys came to the crossroads of a decision. It was their Dante moment. I'm going to call it the Dante moment of temptation. These two individuals are having a Dante moment of temptation. Now you understand this is for the sake of illustration. But they're funny. They're having, they're having a Dante moment of temptation with this phone. On their phone, listen to me, young people. On the phone, they are tempted to browse places they should not browse. They're tempted to send texts they should not text. <laughs> they are tempted to communicate with people they should not communicate with. Okay, and so these two guys, we learned that they both are aware of Jesus' teaching, right, on temptation. They're aware of their knowledge. I mean, you thought maybe you don't know. Let me offer the. Let me just offer this. Jesus talking about temptation. Basically, I'll boil it down. Basically, Jesus says, the thing that continually causes you to stumble into sin should be removed from your life. Listen to me. This is what Jesus is saying. Remember, he talks about plucking out the eye, cutting off the hand. He said, the thing that causes you to continually stumble into sin must be removed out of your life if you're going to have consistent spiritual gain. So, these two guys right here, these two guys are making this decision. They have the choice right here. Dante moment of the decision right here. Struggling with this phone. We have a wise man here. The wise man, he says, you know, as a Christian... I'm not going to allow this phone to ruin my spiritual life. If anything, can, if this thing causes me to continually fall into sin, I'm going to take extreme measures to take this thing out of my life. I'm not going to allow this thing right here to have a little bit of enjoyment during this time we call life and make it make me miss heaven. I'm not going to do it. Wonderful choice. Excellent. Great choice. This man over here, he said, whatever. I can do this. I can keep my phone and keep my relationship with Jesus Christ. But when along, in a moment of temptation, <clears throat> in weakness, he yields and his house crumbles. Crumbles. <laughs> Alright, you guys can scoot to the side just a minute. Thank you. I'll call you back in just a minute because they get to do it again. Isn't that <laughs> Give my hand. Now, I'm going to bring it right down to here. Focus in on me for just a second. Young people, if you want to stand firm in your walk with God, you are going to have to obey the Word of God and take extreme measures to remove the things from your life that continually cause you to fall into sin. Brother Buckler's been teaching to say amen. That's a good point to say amen. Can you say amen? amen? If that means that you trade in your smartphone for a flip phone, you better do it. That means if, if you need to go home this week after this weekend and clean out the closet of clothes that you're tempted to wear that do not please Jesus, you need 
means getting rid of the screen. Whatever it is, television, DVDs. If it's that thing that's causing you to stumble on the scene, you better get rid of it. <coughs> it means quit hanging out with the friends that do and make you do things that you aren't comfortable doing. You do it. This kind of obedience will call you to stand. Everything else is crumbling around you. <coughs> Many of you would know my, my wife's aunt. Frances Stetler teaches at Penn U. Some time ago, she told me about how when she goes from Penn's Creek to Mifflinburg, <coughs> how many know about that ice cream stand right there? Is it 104 to 42 teeth? Is that where it is? That's the two rows? 45. She says she loves going there to get ice cream. Is ice cream, ice cream wrong? No, that's not the point I'm making. But so that she wouldn't do what she didn't feel like she ought to be doing, she took the back road to Back, back with the ice to avoid that little ice cream place, just so she wouldn't just stop and do something she didn't think she should do. He said, Andrew, that's just a silly, silly little illustration. But let me give you the lesson again. In your areas of weakness, drastic measures will have to be taken if you are to consistently live above sea. And although the drastic measures are crippling in this life, you know, who wants to get rid of this one? I mean, I like mine. Who wants to get rid of this? But if this is the thing in your life that's causing you to fall into sin over and over and over again, it's better to be crippled here than to be crippled in hell forever. Everybody say it. I'm convinced that temptation is not the only thing that causes young people to fall, but another Dante moment. Can you guys do it again? Come back real quick. I won't be as long this time. The second Dante moment. You don't even have to build it yet, quite yet. I mean, you can go ahead, first level, and go ahead down, but you don't have to wear yourself out. I believe, listen to me, I believe a second Dante moment in the life of many of you out here this afternoon is the issue of forgiveness. I'm confident that there are many people, many young people sitting right here under the sound of my voice that the devil has planted in you the seed of bitterness. And you're struggling with forgiveness. These two men come right in. Foolish man, why are you These two men are struggling. Are struggling with forgiveness regarding someone who professes to be a Christian but did something wrong, horribly wrong to them. Either immorally or unethically, whatever it may be. They're struggling with this issue. They're struggling with forgiveness. But what's the teaching Jesus gives? In the New Testament, Jesus is talking about the, about the issue of forgiveness. And it, it seems like the Jews were, were using the teaching that Jesus had given, or that the Lord had given in the Old Testament, eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. That teaching was to prevent the, um, the, the judgment for the crime to exceed the crime. All right, so the Lord gave this, this, gave this command so that, that they wouldn't exceed the punishment higher than the crime. And then we get to the New Testament, and Jesus says, Jesus is talking in the New Testament, it appears the Jews took this law that was in the Old Testament as a license to retaliate, to, to be vindictive. But Jesus says, this is not my teaching. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate. He says, forgive. So these two men right here are faced with a choice to forgive. They understand Jesus' teaching. The wise men... He said, he said, what he did was wrong. What he did was wrong. My life will never be the same because of what that individual did. But you know what? I choose to forgive. Because I didn't deserve forgiveness either. But God forgave. Wonderful choice. Go over here. You're not ready to give it up? <laughs> Jonathan, you're not trying to love man here, he says, I am not going to forgive this man. What he did was wrong. And if I could cause him to suffer and make hell on earth for him the rest of my life, I would do it. As long as I live, I'm not going to forgive him. And that's <laughs> Alright. Thank you, guys. Give another round of applause. I know the 
the issue of forgiveness is a huge issue. It cannot be adequately addressed in a setting like this. I know that there are so many differing circumstances and varying levels of offenses, and I know there's pain involved. But I want you to know that none of those things can change what Jesus said. And that is if we want, if we want to be forgiven, we have to. I don't know what you're struggling with this afternoon. I'm confident there's some here that are struggling with forgiveness. But I want you to know if you're going to stand firm and everything is crumbling around you, you have to obey Jesus' command. This won't be long. I said that last time. It was longer than I intended. All right? Lesson number three, the Dante moment, the crossroad decision, is that of a Christian witness. Jesus says, be salt of the earth and the light of the world. And Jesus, Jesus uses these two important commodities, and he compares it to the disciples' responsibility of making a difference in their world. Basically, Jesus is saying they should prevent decay and dispel darkness in their sphere of influence. <coughs> All right, here we go. Come here, wise man, foolish man, wise man, foolish man. Two builders, our two builders here today, have been invited over to a friend's house for a party. And while they're there at the party, the host says, we're going to watch a video. These guys have never heard of video before. They sit down, they begin watching the video, and it's something that they know Jesus would not be pleased with. Sex scenes, vulgar language, horrible philosophies, worldly philosophies that Hollywood is trying to inundate them with. You know what the wise man said? He says, I shouldn't do this. I'm not going to do this. As a Christian, I don't feel comfortable watching this video. And he says, you know what, if you don't mind, I'm just going to excuse myself. I don't feel comfortable doing this. And lets his light shine. His house stay. Over here, the foolish man, he says, you know, I shouldn't do this. But it's so hard to stand alone. I'll just do it. I'll just do it this once. I'll, I'll stand for Jesus later in his house cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. They're done.
It is a die cast decision that is made beforehand. This is what I want young people to take away with you that I believe will transform your life if you'll allow it to. The quote's not original with me, original with me, but I believe it's the key to you standing firm when everyone else around you is falling. Here it is. Make your decision before you have to make your decision. So when you have to make your decision, your decision has already been made. Can I say it again? Make your decision before you have to make your decision. So when you have to make your decision, your decision has already been made. Several years ago, maybe I should say many years ago, my mother-in-law, Regina Stetler, and three of her friends after school were, were carpooling together on the way home. And one of them suggested that they, they stop and get a beer and I'll taste it. Now, it sounds like maybe something young people would joke about doing, but never really doing. But on that trip home, it became more than just a joking conversation. It really happened. Car pulled into the local establishment. Someone went inside, purchased the beer, came back to the car. You can hear it open. And began passing around the beer can. When it was all over, everyone in that car, except my mother-in-law, had taken a drink and taken the alcohol. Now, let me, let, me, let me quickly remind you that every single person in that car was raised in a Christian home. Christian parents, Christian environment, all of them had a Christian upbringing. The sad but interesting fact surrounding this story is every single one of those people in that car, except my mother-in-law, are no longer Christians today. You say, what made the difference? What was the difference? Sister Stetler made the decision before she had to make the decision. When she had to make her decision. Her decision was already made. You say, Andrew, what are you telling us this afternoon? I'm convinced that too many young people are struggling at the crossroads of obedience or disobedience with every Dante moment they encounter. Every single crossroad. you to hear me well. I want to tell you that you young people can make a choice. A single choice <coughs> that will settle all of the other choices. Do you believe me? Say amen. You can make one choice that will settle all the other choices that you can. What is it, Andrew? It is the deep settled commitment to walk in obedience to God's word and his voice, no matter what that means for your life. Did you catch that last phrase? No matter what it means for your life. No matter what it costs for you. And when you make that choice, Create the foundation that will cause you to stand firm when everything else around you is crumbling. And really, to be honest with you, I believe that single choice is exactly what we're talking about today. That choice of surrender to God. I thought as he was teaching talking about his birthday and doing everything he wanted. I had to slip out, so I don't know how the conclusion happened. But I thought, our young people are living in a world where they act like every day is their birthday. Do whatever they want. Listen to me, young people. The choice you have to make is a deep, settled surrender to walk with God and obey every single asks of you. Make the decision before you have to make the decision. So when you have to make the decision, the decision
decision has already been made. Let's pray again. Father, we thank you for every single other person that is here this afternoon. I believe many of them have made that choice. That single choice that settles the question for any other choice they encounter. And I thank you, Lord, for those who have made that surrender to you. But I'm also convinced that there is many here this afternoon who at their Dante moments, whether it be temptation or forgiveness or whatever it is, at the Dante moment it becomes a huge crisis of obedience or disobedience. My prayer for those young people today, Lord, is that they will make the single choice The choice to walk in obedience to you and let that be the foundation that they can build their life on. I pray, Lord, that you will take my feeble words and feel to every heart that is here. Help us to build a foundation that will give us the foundation that is built for Bless us now. Furtherance of this courage. May your will be accomplished. In Jesus' name.